نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ولان محمد وعلى آل سل على سيدنا ولان محمد وبارك سلوا عليه سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله We've been talking about Imam Hussein al-Islam in Karbala and I'm going to sort of wrap a couple of things up today uh, and then uh, continue on uh, from there inshallah uh, because this is the month of Rajab as I mentioned last week and so Shaban and then Ramadan and the other important thing many important things happen all the time but one of the important very important things that happened in Rajab and according to many scholars on the 27th night of Rajab is the Miraj or the ascension of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so we'll start talking about that uh, but as I said you know as we were talking about last week you know after Imam Hussein al-Islam is martyred you know his sister Bibi Zainab Sallamullah comes out and how she addresses the Rasulullah from Karbala and uh, you know she's describing the scene and at the same time Bibi Umm Salma the mother of the believers the wife of Rasulullah who is the only wife at that time who is living in Medina Munawwara she sees Rasulullah she's in the state of uh, uh, meditation and she sees him in that in this condition and she asks and he tells her and again I'm not going to repeat everything we said last week but she tells or he tells her what has happened in Karbala and she looks at the sand or the dirt that he that he had given her years before that was from Karbala and that had turned to blood and the same thing in Makkah Mukarramah with Ibn Abbas radiallahu where he sees Rasulullah also and Rasulullah informs him of what has happened in Karbala and so you know, the thing is when someone is devoid of guidance there are no limits to the indecency and the evilness that that person will do. You know, it's one thing for someone, for a non-Muslim, you know, to say something against Islam or do something against the messenger or his family or... Because doing something against the family is doing something against the messenger himself. Sallallahu alayhi wa You know, it's one thing if a non-Muslim does this because he doesn't know any better. You know, he openly says, okay, he doesn't accept Rasulullah so as the messenger of Allah. But when someone who claims to be a Muslim does this, this is again where in Surah Hujarat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the etiquette and the respect of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at the end of the verse where he gives the warning that if you do not do this, if you do not respect him and honor him, because the verse starts off with, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O you who believe. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't addressing anyone else. You know, he's not saying, Ya Bani Israel. He's not even saying, Ya ayyuhal nas. You know, he's not addressing mankind in general, he's addressing the believers specifically. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. And at the end of the verse, verse he says, 
أن تحبط أعمالكم وأنتم لا تشعرون that I will wipe away your deeds and you won't even know about it. You know, if someone dies on shirk, then Allah will not forgive him. You know, if someone dies in a condition where he is associating partners with Allah on the day of judgment, this, this belief will not be forgiven. But for the person who's committing shirk, the door of repentance is open until his last breath. But if, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amnu, O you who believe, you know, meaning those who know who Allah is, and those who know that Rasulullah Wasallam is the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then they disrespect Him, then it ends up, أَن تَحْبَتَ عَمَالِكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْرُونَ That your deeds will be wiped away and you won't even know about it. Which means what? You know, the criteria for tawbah, for repentance, one of the criteria is that you acknowledge you've made a mistake. Otherwise, how do you ask Allah for forgiveness? If you're not willing to acknowledge that you've made a mistake, then there is no tawbah. So for such people, the door of repentance is closed. Once you've crossed that line. Which is why when I talked about Zul Khawaisra last week, and for those who want to look up the hadith, the hadith is number 2333 in Sahih Muslim, but then as I said, it also occurs in Bukhari, and in Tirmizi, and Nisai, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, uh, Abu Yala, Hakim, all of m most of the Mufassirin have, have mentioned it in one form of our, or another. Mm -hmm. You know, Rasulullah says when he described it, that man and he described those who follow him and, and those who, who associate with him, what did he say? He said like an ar they will go through Islam like an arrow through its prey. He went into a deeper description of you no know, blood, meaning they won't really gain anything from the religion. Yeah, superficially they're all this, this, you know, they look very religious. But inside, where it really matters, there's nothing. But when you shoot an arrow through the prey, and the arrow exits that prey, the arrow does not come back. The arrow is not like a boomerang that's going to turn around and come back. The arrow goes straight. Once it's gone out, it's not coming back. And this is what Rasulullah is emphasizing, that these people, even though superficially they will have all of these characteristics of, of reading the Qur'an, their tongues constantly wet with the recitation of Qur'an, you know, making salat, making wudu, and the reason that's important is that on the Day of Judgment, what did Rasulullah SAW say? Now, when the companions ask, how will you recognize us? He said, I will recognize you like that horse whose face is white and limbs are white because of the wudu. And these, these parts of your body will become illuminated. Yet for these people, he said, they've got nothing from it. Meaning not even their wudu will benefit them on the Day of Judgment. These are the people when the, when the angel will start dragging them to the fire, Rasulullah <coughs> will say that these are, this is my ummah. And the angels will say, Ya Rasulullah you know, this is what they did afterwards. And the interesting thing is they will say that, Ya Rasulullah, uh, you know, if you look at the wording of the hadith, it says that you don't know uh, what they did after you. People mention this part, say, oh, see, Rasulullah didn't know. 
They forget to mention the next part of the hadith where Rasulullah says, I recognize them very well. I mean, he knows. Yet even there, they will have they will have the benefits of these marks, but those marks will not benefit them in the end. And if we listen to what Imam Hussein al-Islam was telling the people, every time he's going out, and he's telling them what? When you have a ruler who is oppressing the people. But he also specifies that they are, they are making things that are lawful, unlawful, and things that are unlawful, lawful. And they are abandoning the way of Rahman, the way of Allah. And they are abandoning the way of Rasulullah. And they are imposing their own way. He said to not to do anything in this condition, then that person also is is worthy of being rewarded with the fire along with that person. You know, so they weren't satisfied simply killing him. You know, they killed him, they took his clothes off, they beheaded him. And then they ran horses over his body. And all of those who had been martyred alongside with him. This is why the only one he buried was the six months old, Ali Asghar. So they weren't able to run horses over his body, but everybody else. You know, if we look at the Muslim world today, from Morocco all the way to the other end, Bangladesh, and actually Malaysia and Indonesia. What do we see? A bunch of Yazids sitting over us. You know, some to a more, you know, lesser or more degree, but overall the same thing. And of course, you know, the Saudis are, are an open example of this where they come in you know in, in 1924 when the British gave Abdul Aziz the green light to go and attack Haram of course they were on, he was on their payroll because they were paying him 5,000 pounds every month then So he comes and he attacks and then eventually takes over all of Arabia. And what is the religion that they impose? Wahhabism. Becomes the state religion. Because anyone who opposes their ideology is mushrik. These are grave worshippers. Their blood and their wealth is lawful for us. You know, in 1924, Abdul Aziz, the same Abdul Aziz who's the father of all of these kings, you know, he's the one who gave the fatwa when you had 4,000 people from coming from Hadarmouth for the Hajj, men, women, and children. He said that these are grave worshippers, so their blood and their wealth is lawful for us. And they were all slaughtered on their way for the Hajj. Allah. You know, these are things that are well documented. So they imposed this religion where Rasulullah he said that a time will come when the people will call my sunnah bidah. And we see that. Everything is bidah. Everything is haram. 
and everything, everyone is kafir, except for themselves. They publish this ideology, spread it around the world. As they're fulfilling the goals and the aims of their puppet handlers. Again, yes, you know, you can say that, you know, the Muslim world is ruled by tyrants, which it is. Because Rasulullah said what? He said that the Khilafah is for 30 years, after which will come, the, which will come the, uh, a cruel monarchy, which ended with the Ottomans. And then will come the age of tyrants. And then will come Imam Mahdi. Al -salam. Al -salam. Hmm? So we're in the age of tyrants. But the tyrants, these tyrants have their handlers. Yeah. And the whole goal is to fulfill the mission of this Dajjalic system. So that they have, uh, you know, this false messiah can, can emerge and rule the world. And they openly, and this is something they openly declare, oh, we want this messiah coming. Even the symbolism in the countries is all Dajjalic. You look at the Saudi badge, police badge, it's one eye. Yeah, it's easy, you can look it up. Google makes everything easy to look up now. You look it up. You know, one eye between two palm trees. What does that one eye represent? Dajjal. And even the people cleaning the haram. You look at the, the yellow jackets that they wear. If you look at the symbolism on the back of that jacket, you've got the eye in there. You know, and they're openly declaring who they are. And we close our eyes to who they are. Mm. Yeah. Because they want to separate the people from Rasulullah. Which is why they have taken the name of Rasulullah off of the Qiswa. You know, the black uh, sheet that covers the Kaaba. They have taken the name of Rasulullah off of it. But the name of the king is on it. You know, it's like, you know, the, that clip of that uh, religious police, you know, he's telling uh, the people there that you should not, uh, in, in Medina Munawar, he's telling that you should not make the masjid filthy. And filthy, he's, and then he explains, he says making the masjid filthy doesn't simply mean, you know, tr throwing trash or doing this or doing that, but also to say, Ya Rasulullah, makes the masjid filthy. Now I've got the clip if someone wants to see it. He says, saying, Ya Rasulullah makes the masjid filthy. Because in the masjid you only take the name of Allah. Which is interesting because if I, if I listen to that type of mentality, then I can't even make salat. That's right. I mean, you can't. How do you say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad? Hmm? Yeah. And then people are in awe because people worship money. You know, like when Qarun, you know, Qarun was the first cousin of Musa a.s. You know, you could say he was the George Soros of the time. He gained his wealth through the misery of, of the children of Israel. And he had a camel just to carry the keys to his treasures. And when he came out, there were some among the believers who were in awe of him. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
made the earth swallow him along with his treasure. And even to this day, he's still going down, down, and down until the day of judgment. So the same thing, you know, oh, you know, because they, 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 you know, put out these books that have nothing except rhetoric against Rasulullah. They're not, this is, you know, Yazid wasn't just then. Yazids have, many Yazids have come since that Yazid. And now we're full of Yazids. But we have, you know, because we don't even know what sacrifice Imam Hussein al-Islam gave for us. Then we see these modern day Yazids and we say, oh, you know, what great people. You know, unfortunately that this, you know, there's this concept in Christianity that's called the prosperity gospel. It's what they push these days. And all these evangelical preachers, this is what they push in the prosperity gospel. That if God loves you, then He's going to give you more and more money. So the richer you are, the more God loves you. And this is why the evangelicals, when Trump came up, all fell into line. Oh, God must love him because he's got so much money. I mean, you know, and, and we, 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 when we hear this, you know, this prosperity gospel, we all think, oh, you know, this is, you know, what a messed up thought process. You know, even from a Christian standpoint, if, if being Christian means being Christ-like, well, that's the opposite of Christ-like. Because Isa al-Islam had no possessions. You know, this, he was traveling one time, he had a comb, a, a, a pillow. And he laid down, he put his head on the pillow and he thought that, you know, why should I rely on the pillow? So he gave the pillow away. He put his hand down, that's how he'd sleep. He was combing his beard, and then he thought, well, why do I need the comb? He just used his fingers. He had no possessions other than the clothes on, on his back. So when we, we think of this, you know, we, we think of, when we hear this prosperity gospel, we think, oh, you know, what a messed up ideology. And yet we're doing the same thing. You know, it's easy to look out. It takes a lot of effort to look in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran reminds us and exhorts us to keep looking in. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa taught us to look in. You know, we can go on and on. And as I said last week, you know, the atrocities against the family of Rasulullah they don't end there in Karbala. They will continue on. And inshallah, later we'll start talking about those as well. Because as I said, you know, this is Rajab. Uh, and I said last week, you know, on the 13th, which was yesterday, today is the 14th. So the 13th was the birth of Sayyidina Ali, the 27th night will be the night of Miraj. And so, for a few